Welcome into Broadcaster Hour. It's high noon on the East Coast, 11 a.m. Central for some of us, and we are glad you're with us for this edition of the Broadcaster Hour. I'm Roger Hoover with you from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. On the other side of the screen, we got Kyle Crooks from Gainesville, Florida. Now we're pleased to be joined by one of our longtime friends, the radio broadcaster, play-by-play voice of the Cincinnati Reds, Tommy Thrall, who's in the middle of the screen. How's it going, Tommy? Hey guys, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Doesn't this seem like Bragan Field in July 2015? I think that season, the Jacksonville Suns, where Kyle and I worked, uh, along with, hang on, I'm hearing myself as well. And I think we visited maybe 30 times a year. At that point, Tommy, the Suns and the Blue Wahoos are playing like 30 times a year. Yeah, there were there were a lot. I think uh, I think you can judge that. You know, they say you can figure out the age of a tree by checking the rings. I think you can look at the liver damage from that season to figure out how many times we met. <laughs> no doubt about it, but we certainly had some fun uh, during our days in the Southern League, and of course now uh, you're in your second full-time season with the Cincinnati Reds, and uh, also uh, three years getting to broadcast some big league baseball with Cincinnati, but uh, Tommy, we'll start this kind of like we started with uh, everybody on this show. Uh, first of all, where are you from? Why did you get into broadcasting? Who were some of your early influences? Yeah, no, in all seriousness, uh, it, first of all, the time in the Southern League that, that we all spent together was was a lot of fun. But, I mean, I think that's that's what led us all. I mean, that was a big jumping point to, to getting us all to where we're at in our respective careers now. Um, for me, it was, you know, I, I, I had always had this infatuation with radio. I don't know what it was. I, I can still remember being in the living room floor with the radio turned up and, and just listening to the DJs and the music and and um, so I always kind of liked the radio and then um, as I got a little older I, I, I really kind of fell in love with the game of baseball and uh, watching games and hearing the announcers and I thought boy what a job that must be you get to talk on the radio and you get to watch baseball for a living and travel to all these cool cities how awesome is that like is there a better job out there than that and so it was just kind of a way to combine uh, two of my passions, broadcasting, um, radio, and, uh, and baseball. So uh, that's, that's what kind of got me interested in it at an early age. And then um, from there, you know, you figure out what you want to do, and then you try to figure out the right path to get there and, and how to make, you know, once, once the dream's established, how do you make it a reality? Um, and I think that's the hard part that a lot of young people are dealing with now. I think it's something we've all dealt with is you don't know what the path is because it's so different. For so many guys, it's, it starts. The the one thing that I think is consistent across the board is it starts with your education and what and what kind of experience you get based off that education. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to the University of Missouri, or I could have gone to Northwest Missouri State. And I tell people all the time, I said that uh, is the education a little better at Mizzou? It might be. I don't know. I never went there, but I know that when I went on my visit, I asked. Uh, when do you get on the equipment and when can you start getting hands-on experience? Because everybody I had talked to before I had figured out where I wanted to go to college said that the number one thing is experience. Reps, get as better, you can get as good as you can, get better as quickly as possible based on repetition, experience, and the hands-on work. So I knew that was important when choosing a college. So I went to Mizzou, I said, when can you get on the equipment here? And they said, well, if you do well in school, maybe your senior year. And I thought, hmm, I'm not exactly a Rhodes Scholar. That doesn't look good for me. Uh, and then I went to Northwest Missouri State. I asked to stay first semester, my first Friday on campus. I was doing a high school football game on our student radio station, and it was really off and running from there. 50 kids, it was a small school. Uh, but the school knew pretty early on that this is what I wanted to do. Um, and they made every opportunity available to me to help facilitate that at that level so uh, the school allowed me to do the public address for our basketball games if our football PA guy had to miss they threw me in there for that just to get me used to public speaking and that stuff even at a young age I I didn't realize how much of a difference that made but that really helped me Uh, really once I got to college it made me a lot more comfortable once once I got in there and started doing games so I gotta give a lot of people credit back at my high school and it started with our high school football coach, actually. Uh, Mr. Vickers was one of my civics teachers, and then our principal, uh, Mr. Kruger, Wayne Kruger, was was a big help as well. So a, a, a lot of support along the way. 
Tommy, what are some of the things that you learned early on in your minor league career? You, you start out Quad Cities, you go to Myrtle Beach, you're in Pensacola. What are the things that you're working on fairly early and you wish you knew back then the things that you know now, just starting out your minor league career and starting that journey? Yeah, you know, I always thought that the, the repetition just alone was going to help you get better. And it does to some extent. Um but it was it's so much more than that. You really get better by sending your stuff out and getting critiques. And that's something that I tell kids all the time now. I say, I, you're going to listen to your stuff. You're not going to feel like you're good enough to send it out. Um, but that's how you get better. So you, you've got to just bite the bullet, send your stuff out, get as many critiques from as many different people as possible. And that's where you get better. Because then you take that into the work you're doing, and now you're improving. I wish I would have done a lot more of that early on. I didn't. I really didn't do much of it. I just kind of felt like doing the games, listening to myself, doing a lot of self critiquing, which you have to do, uh, would do the trick. And it wasn't until later that I really kind of realized you've, you've got to get a lot of feedback from a lot of different people. And not only doing that makes you better, but it opens doors for you that you don't even realize. I mean, you're going to make contacts off that eventually. If you do a good job, you're going to send your stuff out to somebody that's going to like it. And then they're going to send it out to somebody else. And, and all, now you've got some connections that you weren't necessarily even trying to get. But but now you've 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 branched out your circle a little bit to, to help you. So that was something I wish I would have started doing a lot earlier. Oddly enough, I wasn't big on preparation. I know this will shock Roger. Uh, I was not a huge... <laughs> I, I was a huge preparation guy uh, early on when I started. Kind of just looked at the game notes. I would talk to guys around the team, and that was about it. And, and it wasn't until, oh, probably I got to Pensacola where I really started to buckle down and bear down on the preparation. So that was pretty late in my career to really start honing in on, on preparation, which is still something that I, I struggle and work with, work hard at this to this day. Oh, you were buckling down then. Okay. I mean, our scorebooks <laughs> looked a little different, but okay. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Well, preparation was elsewhere besides the scorebook. <laughs> it's all up here. It's all up here. Yeah, that's right. So, Tommy, preparation-wise, too, how much now are you still going to the cages? Like, how much a part of the preparation process is that person-to-person -person contact with the players, being in the clubhouse, being at the cage three hours before the game, as opposed to just the game notes? How much are you doing a lot of that uh, personal communication with players, coaches? I think it, you, you have to do a lot of it. Um, and it's more, uh, at least last year for me, it was more in the clubhouse before the games. The clubhouse will open a certain amount of time before the game. You go into the clubhouse, and, and I, I still have to do quite a few player interviews. So that gives me an opportunity while I'm in there. Maybe I don't need to interview a guy, but I may want to talk to him about an at-bat he had. Or maybe I know that he's trying to make some adjustments, and I'll talk to him then in the clubhouse not as much around the cage just the the routine is, is so much different and that was something that took me a while to get used to because you know the the batting cage was something that you plan into your routine and and you know when you're in the minor leagues and uh that's just something we would do uh oddly enough a big part of our day is uh having dinner together and this sounds this sounds kind of wild but uh marty tom Jim Day, Jeff Brantley, Chris Welsh. That's basically our, our broadcast crew there. And, and some others. Dave Armbruster, who is our radio engineer. Um, and there's there's other guys that, that come and go. But that's the main core of us that all eat together every night. So you, you almost plan your pregame routine around that. I mean, this is – dinner every night is an event with this group. It was it, – it's so much fun. So it, it's – it's also, I've realized, looking around at, at other broadcast crews around the league, it's not that common. So it's something special that this group in Cincinnati has. But usually when we're eating dinner, it's about the time when the Reds are taking batting practice. So all those conversations are had a lot of times. I'll, I'll talk to the manager. I do a manager interview before every game, and I will ask him other questions that I may have that, that I don't have time for on the air. I'll pick his brain about decisions he's made or what's going on with the team and, and various topics just to get a little more in-depth information around that time. And then, like I said, when the clubhouse is open, I'm in there and you try to make the most out of that time and talk to guys and, and 
that's where you kind of get some more information that maybe I would get around the cage. Of course, we joke about all the preparation uh, that you would do. And in the minor leagues, it's so different as well because you're not only the radio broadcaster, but you're the media relations contact. And home games are just kind of their own animal as well. But you were also, for many years, Pensacola, doing a radio talk show and would get to the stadium just before games. So did all of that really help you figure out what's most important in a broadcast? And I assume that would be really the game above all. Yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, I, I think that... Yeah, it really helps you make the most out of the the least amount of information you have. I, I I mean, this is this is no joke. You take me back to the, you make the the hairs on my arm stand up, <laughs> give me chills talking about the radio show that I hosted for. Well, I think that was about a year and a half before they wised up and realized that was a bad idea. <laughs> uh, but no, they. Um, I mean, it was it was to the point where I would leave the studio. I want to say a half hour before first pitch. And I actually had that part of the intern responsibilities for our, our media relations and broadcast intern was to fill out my scorebook for me. I mean, this is no joke. I, I didn't have time to do it. And so that was, I, I felt bad, but it was about the only way I could get ready for a game because we, by the time I went to the station, we didn't have lineups yet. Um, so I, I would leave for the station about one. I think the show was three to six roughly. And then the game started at 6.30. So, um, yeah, you really have to figure out what's important. The game is certainly a great place to start. And then a little bit of background information. You want to know what the pitchers have been doing lately. Uh, so you want to make sure you have that information. And then, like I said, read over the game notes as quick as you can. Skim through those. And uh, But the game is first and foremost, almost always. If you, if you don't go into a game and you don't feel quite prepared, just know that you've still got the game and it's always going to be and should always be the main story. Well, that was part of your time with the Wahoos earlier, and then I remember near the end of your Blue Wahoos days, you became extremely organized uh, using Microsoft OneNote or any other apps to really get organized. What can you tell us about some of the individual player research you would do in those days, and I imagine you still do now with the Reds? Absolutely, yeah. There's a lot more information available on guys now, so there's a lot more to sort through. The one thing I I always found, and I struggled with this, uh, it's easier, I will say this, it's easier at the big league level because you have a pretty good idea who, where guys are going to be, who who guys are going to play for. Um, Free agents obviously shake that up a little bit, but for the most part, you can get a pretty good feel on where guys are going to be. and the minor leagues, you don't necessarily know who your roster is going to be. The reason that makes it easier at the big league level is because you can do a lot of that player background information during the offseason. And that's where you can really kind of build up that database. So that way, once the season rolls around, you're focused on what guys are doing right now. All right, is this guy on a 10-game hitting streak? Is he having a hot month of May? Or, you know, the current stuff is what you're focusing on at that point. Uh, the season-long storylines. Maybe this guy's uh, in an MVP race or this guy's trying to chase down a batting title. You can focus on that stuff and not have to worry about, oh, did he save a cat from Sally's tree around the corner? You know, stuff like that. So, But the way you get those stories, and I think those are the stories that make a player human. Those are the things you want to know. And you, don't, you just type their name into a Google search. It's that simple. And then you, you try to find the articles. You want to find the stories. The, the things I like to find out, what's a player's hometown? And then a lot of these guys are from relatively small towns that have their own papers. And those newspapers do a lot of really good background stories on guys. And you can get some nuggets that way. Where did a guy go to college? And the, the media outlets that cover that college will do some background stories on these guys. And usually you get some of the background stuff from articles from guys earlier in their lives. And uh, that, that to me, is, is pretty fascinating. And it's fun, but it's it, it's so easy to get trapped in a rabbit hole. I mean, there's been times where I look down at the clock and two hours have gone by, and I've got three notes. I may like the notes, but there are three notes on one guy, and I've spent two hours on it. And that, that will happen from time to time. It, it's something.
three or four. All right, we apologize for the few technical difficulties. Fun of doing a live show, but we are uh, certainly back here on Broadcaster Hour. Uh, first snafu we've had, and we're not going to blame Tommy for that at all, but we will go. You should. <laughs> you should. Trust me. <laughs> In addition to preparing extremely well for games, uh, Tommy was an engineering wizard during his days in the Southern League, uh, especially ask our friends, the Birmingham Barons. But anyway, <laughs> we will go back to Kyle, who had a couple of great baseball questions. Yes, yeah, so we, we talked about who you listen to, Tommy, but um, yeah. I want to go to, so now you're you're filling in for Marty, and essentially two years ago, you, you do the three games right at the end of the season yeah. uh, against San Diego, and now you fill in as you're, you're doing some pregame, all the postgame, and you fill in for Marty. How do you deal with those the situations of not treating it like an audition, knowing that all the ears are on you and, and you really have to deliver because it's it's essentially a pseudo audition all this time that you're filling in for Marty before you finally realize this is going to be your gig. I don't feel like you have to treat it like it's an audition. Uh, I mean, you, you, you treat every game, and you should anyways. I think really I think you should treat every game with a high level of respect anyways. Uh, you never know what's going to happen in any particular game. That that day may end up being a historic moment in baseball. You never know when a guy is going to throw a no hitter. I mean, it could look like a, a pretty lousy pitching matchup on paper, and then all of a sudden somebody hits for the cycle, or you know somebody has a breakout game and hits four home runs in a night. You never know what's going to happen in any given night. So you've got to go into every broadcast, I think, uh, treating it special, anyways. So I think when you go into a season like that, um, like last year, you you do. You just try to be on every night, and you, you try to be the best you can be. And so I think, yeah, you almost – you don't want to make yourself nervous. You don't want to, you know, kind of paralyze yourself emotionally. But at the same time, I think you do have to understand the magnitude of the situation. Uh, but – by doing, by just getting caught up in the game and focusing on doing your job, uh, and having faith and having the confidence in your abilities, I think that just kind of takes over a little bit. And you, once you're doing the game, I don't think you're really thinking about, oh man, this. If I if I say the wrong word here, this could cost me my dream job. You know, you can't. That's what I mean. Like you can't uh, emotionally paralyze yourself. Um, or psychologically paralyze yourself like that. So you just have to get caught up in the game and, and do the game the best that you know how to do. Um, that, the one thing I would say last year, probably held back a little bit. You know, I, I think you just try to... You, I felt like when I was doing games last year, to some extent, I was a guest on Marty's broadcast, and, I, and, and rightfully so. And I think it'll still feel that way probably for a while. Uh, but I, I think you don't necessarily... I don't know that you're necessarily the full version of yourself, if that makes sense in a situation like that, because you're just trying to make sure that you you keep the train on the track, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I think as you get more comfortable in any situation, you just your personality comes out a little bit more and more as you go. And I know that was the case even when I was in Pensacola. I, I think I was probably more of myself by the time I left than my first couple of years there. And Tommy as well, uh, Marty had said in his post game goodbye, he says, you know, the fans, you accepted me 46 years ago when I became the voice. And, and he says that he hopes the fans accept you like they accepted him. What did that mean to you? And uh, to, uh, the second part of that question would be, do you get wrapped up in, you know, because Twitter, social media, it's it can be evil sometimes. And, and I think when people take these jobs, you don't know how people can react to some of the comments from people out there, whether it's praise, whether it's criticism, negativity. Do, how do you when you take such a whole high profile job from such a high profile person, how do you deal with all of the ancillary stuff that might come with it in terms of, say, social media? I think one of the things you have to do, and I've talked to a lot of people about this. I, I had a great conversation with a guy that was kind of a mentor to me growing up uh, in, in broadcasting. That's Ryan Lefevre who does Royals games in Kansas City. And we talked about that a little bit. And you try, you try not to put too much stock into the criticism because you're going to get criticism. But at the same time, how much of that can you actually use? All right, maybe somebody makes a point where 
hey, I wish this guy would show a little more personality. He's kind of dry. Well, you know what? I think I've got some personality I can showcase. All right, maybe I should relax a little bit. Maybe I am too timid. Um, and so, or, or it could be a word that you're saying repeatedly. All right, well, that's criticism you can use. So th there are things out there uh, when you read it, think to yourself, all right, is this constructive? Can I actually use this to get better? And a lot of times the answer is going to be yes, and there's nothing wrong with that. If it's just hateful, you can write that off pretty easily. Uh, and sometimes people just need an avenue to vent, and maybe it's not even what you're doing. It's just something in their personal life, and you just happen to be uh, the avenue that they can express some, blow off some steam towards. And, and that's, that is what it is, and you just kind of have to let that roll off your back. Uh, but you just try to stay even keeled, make sure that you're doing the best job you can do. That, that's all you can do. At the end of the day, you're only going to be able to do what you're capable of doing. You're not going to be able to go out and be Joe Buck. You're not. So don't try to be Joe Buck. Just be you and be the best version of you that you can be. And I think if you stick with that every night, you'll be in good shape and, and the rest will kind of hopefully fall into place. And, you know, fans may like you. They may not. It, it could be a situation that works out. Maybe it doesn't. I, You know, you don't know. Time will tell. But uh, it, it also... You know, when you grow up as a fan of a team, you understand that when there's a, a change at broadcaster, sometimes it takes a little adjustment. And, I, you know, a guy like Ryan Lefevre, again, going back to him, when he took over in, in Kansas City, he took over for a guy named Fred White, who had been Denny Matthews' partner for 25 years. That was a tough transition for a lot of fans. But, you know, as time went along, you warm up to somebody like that, and you realize – you know, now I think he's probably the most popular broadcaster that team has. So that that it, it takes it takes time. Um, but, you know, you just like I said, you can't you can't dwell too much on the negative. But at the same time, you try to figure out ways to get better based on maybe what's said. Something else I think really helps you in this transition is uh, your partner, Jeff Brantley, who is known by national fans across baseball for his work on ESPN and baseball tonight, but has been really entrenched with the Reds for many years. Just what's it like working with him and uh, making sure you really involve him in all parts of the broadcast? It's so much fun working with Jeff. We have a ball together. In fact, you know, Jeff and I text quite a bit during this downtime. We text periodically during the off season and stay in touch and, I've been really fortunate to not just have Jeff as a partner, but a friend. And I think that's that's a big that's been a big help to me in in getting comfortable. Not everybody has that. i'm I'm fortunate to have that with Jeff. But besides that, his baseball knowledge is incredible. Uh, he just he knows so much about the game. He sees the game in ways I've never uh, thought of. And I love the game of baseball, so anytime I have a question, I can just bounce it off him. I mean, when we're doing a game, our minds wonder all the time anyways. Well, now I've got a perfect guy to talk to about the game of baseball with. And we just sit there, and for three hours a night, we're talking baseball. Uh, and it, maybe it's the game, maybe it's something else going on. But then the other thing of it, too, is, is Jeff's got a lot of personality that you can showcase and, and bring out. And that, to me, has been a lot of fun to, to draw that out of him. Uh, we did a lot of that during spring training, whether it was talking about movies. We all know he likes to talk about food. I like to talk about food. We both have that in common. Uh, but we don't want to get caught up in that's all we talk about outside of baseball. So it's just all part of getting to know each other. Uh, and, and like I said, he's just been a lot of fun. He could not have welcomed me in any better than what he has it, it's it, he really even from the time I went and did a few spring training games with him a few years ago he made me feel welcome then and came up uh you know Kyle you talked about the three games I did against San Diego at the end of the 2018 season he called me at the end of that and told me that he was really impressed and and gave me a lot of praise for that it was just it was really nice and so we got off to a, a great start right out of the gate and it's a relationship that, that has just continued to build, I think, over the last couple of years. And it's, it's like I said, he's a great baseball guy. He's a good friend. And I couldn't ask for a better guy to work with. 
When it comes to baseball play-by-play -play on the radio, how do you try to balance being as descriptive as you can be with not being overly descriptive, falling behind the play? Just kind of what's your mindset? What's the best baseball radio play-by-play -play in your eyes? I think you just you come up with the words that can most accurately and succinctly describe the action. So you want to try to use as few but as descriptive adjectives as you can come up with. And the way you do that, again, it goes back to listening to a lot of guys. And I think the more guys you listen to, the more ways you're going to come up with to describe things. You, you don't want to get overly descriptive, though. I mean, I think you try to get too flowery, and then it's too much. Um, so there's a balance there. Uh, you want to set the scene, uh, and you want to continue to kind of set the scene. But the scene changes as the game goes along, whether it's the shadows on the field or maybe the sunsets. I, I mean, we've all been to Pensacola and seen the, the sunset at Blue Wahoo Stadium, there's about a 30-minute window. It is just a magical scene there. And um, so you, you just try to describe those situations as, as the lighting changes. It maybe changes the, um, the way the ballpark looks. But from an actual play itself, yeah, just try to use as few words but still be as descriptive as possible. You know, it's... Uh, a one-hop smash in the hole at short, backhand pick, and a strong throw in time. You know, you can you can get a lot out of that without necessarily saying too much. Um, and so I think that's the biggest thing. Just try to use as descriptive of words as you can come up with while still using as few words as possible. Being on the radio, laying out, so essentially just letting the crowd tell the story. How much do you utilize that? Because I, I feel like sometimes radio guys are a little hesitant to sometimes just have eight seconds of say nothing and just let the crowd kind of, even if it's you know a one zero pitch, you know uh, right after a one zero pitch in the fourth inning, you just kind of let it run out for eight seconds of nothing. How much could that be, say, a weapon in a broadcast? Like you said, don't use as many words in description, but maybe not use any words at all. It's That's great. I, I think radio, the crowd and the sounds of the game really kind of help feed the theater of the mind a little bit. And so I think that's important. I don't do as good of a job of that as I should. That was one of the things that Marty's harped on me a lot about is really just kind of letting the game breathe a little bit. Um which I think is, is maybe a new problem for me. I, I don't. I, I used to think that I probably didn't talk enough, and uh, now maybe I've I've overcorrected a little bit. So trying to find that balance still. There's no. I don't think there's a recipe for it. I think that's just all when it comes down to feel. You don't want to suffocate a game on radio, or on TV for that matter. To and, and the, we can get into that later. But the two styles are completely different. But we're talking about radio here. You've got to let the game breathe. It's easier to do when there's a crowd. You know, if you're doing a game and uh, say it's a minor league game and there's 400 people in the stands, it's really hard to let a game breathe because there's nothing there. Uh, but if you're doing a game and it's a big, big crowd, yeah, let it let it breathe a little bit. Let the crowd kind of tell the story, and especially after you hit a big play. And I think that's where being on time comes into play, because if it's a great play. And it's a big moment in the game, and the crowd's going to react. You don't want to be talking over that reaction. You want to get in, make the point, get out, and then let the crowd react. And that's that's the one thing where I would say in big moments, really let let the crowd kind of help tell the story. Home runs especially, once you say it's gone, lay out. Let the crowd take it. You know, I, I usually try to let the crowd go for a couple of bases while the guy is rounding, um, especially if it's a big home run. And then maybe once he crosses home, high fives everybody. Then you go into all right. Now what what exactly does that home run do? You know maybe we're all tied and it's the eighth inning or something. But yeah, let let the crowd tell the story, especially on those big moments, big plays. Hit the play and get out and get there as as quick as you can. And on that point, I guess of of not trying to talk too much. How do you utilize stats and numbers? Because you know. I've been guilty of this. I'm sure a lot of people have of just throwing out stats because you have them. Um, it, it, besides batting average, home runs, RBI, first time they come to the plate, what are some numbers that you like to use and 
Uh, what are some numbers that you think are that you don't really need for a broadcast? Maybe are good in certain situations, but sometimes are overdoing it a little bit. I I don't get into the analytical stats hardly at all. Now, if a guy's war is off the charts and he's you know maybe it's really, I mean noteworthy all right then maybe you talk about that if he's in the mvp race okay now war comes into play but you use the numbers to back up another point that you might be making don't use the numbers just to use the numbers you always especially on radio i would say this more than anything because when you're listening on radio you're you're trying to focus on the game and what's happening in the game and when numbers are thrown at you unless you're using the numbers in some sort of real context to to magnify a point or drive a point home, the number is going to be in one ear and out the other. It's not going to stick with people. So that's what I try. I try hardly ever use numbers. If I can avoid it, I will at all costs. But in this day and age, you know, with, with so many more analytical numbers, I think you have to have an understanding of what they mean. So if you do have a need to use them, you can. Well, why? I don't understand why the baseball world is so high on this guy. Well, now you can relay, well, the reason they like him is his war is high. What does war mean? All right. Well, you get into that a little bit, but he does this and this and this well. And maybe you don't even have to throw out the numbers, but you can explain, you know, he's great defensively. He gets on base a lot. He gets on base at one of the highest rates in the league. All right. Now you've just basically given a stat without giving a stat. Does that make sense? So I think you use you use the information to help make a point, not be the point. And we've talked a lot about radio, and of course your role now is as the radio voice of the Cincinnati Reds, but you've also done a lot of television, whether it's for baseball, basketball, football. Just how do you approach uh, being a television play-by-play broadcaster, really, for any of those sports? It's so much different. I think the background information is so much more important there because the game the game is obviously the story, but you don't have to describe every pitch. You, you may want to set it up, but it's so much different now even uh, – with all the retro games that have been on TV, I, I don't know how much of those you guys have watched, but I, I've, it's kind of fun to watch some of those yeah. because even the broadcasting has changed a lot. Once the score bug, uh, the little the, the little score graphic came into vogue, uh, and it shows the count, the score, where the base runners are. I mean, that takes away a lot of the setup that you would ordinarily have in a broadcast. Um, so it's it's more of telling the background of the players, getting into the things that they can't necessarily see, and then you're just captioning the pictures. That's all you're providing. You're not necessarily describing in detail what's going on as it's happening. You're just providing the captions for the pictures. So don't get too wordy, and that's where less is really more. And the other thing about TV, and it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's football, basketball, soccer, tennis, doesn't matter. Your analyst is the hero. Uh on TV. Set them up as often as you can, as well as you can. And don't don't say too much to where they don't have anything to say afterwards. Let them really kind of drive the points home. And just it, you're there to faci- uh, facilitate their knowledge on TV. And that's that is a big, big difference between TV and radio. We always like to talk about voice on this show, and of course, you have a voice, and knowing you uh, away from the broadcast as well, your speaking voice is very similar to the voice we hear on air whenever you call a game. Has there been anything you've done uh, throughout your development, whether in the minors or in the big leagues, to really think about voice, or do you just always try to keep it in the natural voice we're used to hearing from Tommy Thrall? Yeah, I don't know why that's hard for us to do that in broadcasting, but it's really hard to just be yourself on the air and just let your natural voice take over. That, that to me, is something that I struggled with for a long time. You know, you go back, you listen to yourself, and you go, well, that's not how I talk. So you have to figure out where that is. You know, you have to, it goes back to what we talked about earlier. You've got to find the right energy and without losing the conversational tone. And so that's a tough balance. And I, I think that's something that you should really focus on all the time because that's to me the mark of a really good broadcaster if you can if you sound conversational that's where it starts that's the good foundation there while keeping the right energy because you don't want to sound bored you don't want to sound dull uh you've got to make sure you you certainly don't want to be monotone on the air but you don't want to be over the top so you have to go back you have to constantly listen to yourself uh 
some guys have taken voice lessons, uh, have vocal coaches. I, I think I've just tried to read a little bit. Um, I know one of the things that you hear a lot is speak from your diaphragm uh, and just, just let the words come out. It's something that I know, Roger, you and I have talked about a lot. You want to be down almost in your gut mm-hmm. as opposed to up in your throat. Uh, when you talk and that's just something getting a feel for that and you can look up different vocal exercises that help but using your voice I mean your voice is is really your instrument in broadcasting and so you have to you have to take care of it drink a lot of water that's one thing I would definitely suggest drink a lot of water uh, because you've got to keep your your vocal cords uh, lubricated and water does that so uh, You've got to make sure you stay hydrated, and then just, like I said, you, you just do whatever works for you and listen to how much different you sound when you're having a conversation as to how you sound on the air. You want those two to be pretty close. Tommy, what, and getting back to, you know, trying to break through into the major leagues, and what would you give in terms of advice for minor league announcers out there in terms of getting their tape out, even if it's in, if, if it's during the season? How often did you keep in touch say with the reds when you're in pensacola was it once every two months just to show them this is what i'm doing this is how i'm working on my craft what would you suggest to a minor league announcer announcer out there to to tell them this is how you should be reaching out this is how often you should be reaching out just to stay on a major league radar i would say send stuff to the reds well our engineer i would send him stuff because i had a relationship with him I think I sent Marty my stuff a couple of times, uh, and I had sent tape, I think, to my now boss once a few years ago. Um, so you just you do little things to stay on the radar, but you it's such a fine line between staying on the radar and being a nuisance, because as soon as you cross that line and of becoming a pest, you're out. I mean, that's... Now they don't. Oh gosh, it's another, it's another email from Roger Hoover. When is this guy gonna figure out? <laughs> I know, email? right? Right. So what a uh, persistent pest. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you know, there's a fine line. I, I tell guys a lot, and I think I think Roger and I have had this conversation. If they respect your work, you're not going to be a nuisance. And but there's no way really of knowing that. That's the hard part because so often you send stuff out and you never hear anything back. That's not uncommon. You have to get used to that. But I, I think if you're sending stuff out every couple of weeks to the same person, that's a, that's a bit much. I, I do every few months, I think. It is probably a fair amount. Um, you know, biannually, you're not going to wear anybody out if you send something a couple times a year, but they're probably going to remember who you are. Ryan Lefevre and I corresponded back and forth maybe once a year, probably not even that frequently. And... Um, you know, enough that we were able to catch up and, and connect, uh, but not so much that, you know, it was, I, I felt like I was pestering him. Uh, if it's somebody you have a really close relationship with, yeah, you send stuff out. You, you got to have a few regulars that you're sending stuff to maybe once a month. But those, that's you, something you have to gauge. Are you close enough with that person um, to do that? Because you want you want constant feedback, and, and like I said, you're going to send stuff out so often that you're not going to hear anything back. So I would say make it a point at least once a month to send something to somebody new. Maybe a couple times a month, send something to somebody new. Uh, if it's if it's a connection you're trying to really massage, be careful with that. A couple of times a year maybe is a good amount. Somebody may tell you differently. Some guys may say you can't send stuff out enough all they can do is ignore it anyway so um i am more i guess a little i'm a little more cautious when it comes to stuff like that but some guys would be more aggressive though those are just kind of some of the rules i take into account but again like when you when you're sending stuff out you always want it to be your best now it doesn't have to be hall of fame worthy but it has to be the best version of yourself because you don't know who you send it to, who they're going to send it to. So keep that in mind at all times. Make sure whatever it is is your best. And and but the more you send it out, the more uh, doors you have a chance of opening. 
And Tommy, what what is on those tapes? Is it a five run inning? Could you send an inning with no runs? But you knew, like I was, I was crisp here. I, I told the story. There was a beginning, middle, and end. I paused. I called every pitch, but there were no runs. There were, there was no action. I like that. What exactly is on that tape? Do you think? I like that the best. That's the one. I want the stories. I want to. You can always. I always. Uh, somebody told me this. You want it to. You want to start and finish with your best. Okay, so maybe you're really good at big calls. All right, put a couple of those on there at the beginning, just kind of as a teaser. You know, just a just a little something to to whet the appetite, get their attention right out of the gate. Boom, couple of big plays, but good plays. I mean, very descriptive. You got to the point. You got in. You got out. And two or three of those, quick, maybe 30 seconds total of highlights, and then exactly what you were talking about. Show me what makes you a good broadcaster. That's what people want to hear. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of action. I always think the crowd, try to do a game with, with some good crowd noise because that's just going to make it sound a little better. You're always going to sound better with a big crowd. Uh, you want there to be some degree of action, whether it was maybe a stolen base or a, maybe an extra base hit, something in there with some action. But like you said, maybe there's not a lot going on. Maybe there is a beginning, middle, and an end. You, you told a good story. You let the game breathe at the right points, and you just felt really good about that inning. Fine, send it out. The highlights will take care of the excitement part anyways. And then close it out with maybe a quick interview that you did. Uh, don't make it too long. If it's 10 minutes, nobody's going to listen to the full 10 minutes. If you can keep it to about five minutes, you're pretty close to the sweet spot there. And, and keep in mind, most people are going to listen for about 30 seconds. Um, if they, if they kind of like what they hear, they'll keep listening. But you want it to be, you want your best to be right out of the gate. Make sure you do, you, you have something good to catch their attention. But yeah, five to 10 minutes is probably the sweet spot. Yeah, that's something that's been really helpful for me when I've worked on demos is kind of that advice. You grab their attention. And I think that's something you also would say for, say, a television demo. What do you want to see on the TV demo? Yeah, same thing. I, I think you do, you do the same thing. I, I, you, you've got to make sure you're on camera at some point. So you probably want to open with that. Just a couple of quick stand-ups. Uh, then you you have a couple of highlights. I probably shouldn't give out too much TV work or too much TV advice. I, I've never been really good at getting TV jobs. So, uh, but <laughs> well, we'll say you've been good when you've been on TV. We've all seen it. You know, you're you did a very nice job with Cox. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I think you you want to make sure you've got some. Uh, you want to show what you look like on camera you've got to have that in there a couple of highlights again and then the same kind of format you know let's let's do a couple of extended uh, tv i think i did a little differently i think i maybe did two minutes of uncut play by play uh and then maybe i do an at bat you know sometimes you can cut it up with a full at bat here and there um so that that's a little different maybe basketball it might be different maybe it's a drive or maybe it's a series of downs that you can put in there uh basketball maybe it's yeah you break it down by a few possessions but you definitely want to have some uncut extended play by play in there to some extent you might just do it a little differently and and on tv with a tv reel than you would radio one of the great things about uh, getting to the major leagues is you're starting to meet a lot of your heroes. And I know last spring training, this story has been out there before, but uh, <laughs> what can you tell us about the first time you met Bob Uecker? Uh, so the, that was probably the highlight. So many of the highlights from last year came in spring training. It was, it was really fun. Uh, I got to do about 10 games with Marty last year too, which was, which really was neat. I mean, you're, I talked about Jeff earlier. He, he is a wonderful partner. I couldn't ask for a better guy to work with, but it was such a privilege to work with Marty. I mean, the guy's a Hall of Famer. I mean, that's something that you just don't you don't get a chance to do very often. So that was really special to me. Marty and I are doing a game in Maryville at the Brewers Spring Training Complex, and I I love Uke. I mean, not just not just the movie Major League. We've all seen Major League. He's outstanding to me. He makes the movie. Uh, he was, I thought, even better in the second one than he was the first one. But that's besides the point. I, I, I've listened to him on the air. I like the way he calls a game. Kind of the same John Miller type. He always sounds like he's having fun. He's a fun guy to listen to. And I like that energy. He's funny. Um, he carries the humor over into the broadcast. And he does it really well. So I liked what I really like what he does. Um, 
and a guy I didn't mention earlier when I was talking about guys I listened to, Vince Scully was another guy I listened. To. I mean, we all. I mean, he's he's the he's the king when it comes to broadcasting. Um, so listen to him a lot. And I think the sweet spot is a combination of like Vince Scully, John Miller, and Bob Euchre. You know, you just combine the energy, the stories, the humor of all of those guys. It's really something special. Um, and that's kind of what stands out to me about all of those guys. So Euchre, I, I get to meet him. And, um, you know, I, I'm in there filling out my book, and I see down the hall, Marty's in the brewer's booth, and uh, he comes in, and he goes, hey, Uke's down there, you want to go meet him? I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm in the middle of filling out my book. I probably should finish. <laughs> I've mean, got a game to do. I should probably finish getting ready, but no, I'm going to go meet Bob Uke. So we go into the booth, and uh, Marty goes, hey, I got uh, somebody I want you to meet. Because Marty knew, like I had already told Marty, I made the fatal mistake of telling Marty that I was looking forward to meeting <laughs> <laughs> Don't, Don't give Marty any ammo that he doesn't need. So um, so he calls me in there, and uh, we walk into the booth, and, and Marty goes, Hey, you, I, I got somebody I want you to meet. He goes, Yeah, just a second. And uh, then all of a sudden he takes a phone call, and he's talking on the phone, so I think. And uh, after a little while, he turns around. And he goes, uh, "You be in Cincinnati, right?" Yeah, I'll be there. I, I, I'll see you in Cincinnati. I look at Marty. I'm like, I don't know what to do. Do I? Do we stay? Like, I don't. I don't know. I'm awkward. I'm. I'm gonna follow Marty's lead here. If he walks out, I'm walking out. Marty stayed, so I stayed. A few more seconds go by. He turns around again. He goes, "I, I said I'll see you in Cincinnati." <laughs> oh. Now I'm like, that was great. Way to meet Bob Uecker. You know, this is awesome. So I look at Marty. Marty looks a little put off. You know, he's he's kind of perturbed at this point. Marty really sold it at that point. I was like, all right, this is not a prank. Like Marty's Marty's irritated. So we go back in there, and he goes, well, I guess that's you, huh? And about a minute later, the door flies open, and he goes, I got you pretty good, didn't I? And he throws his arm around me and proceeds to just crack us up with stories for thirty minutes straight, and we were in stitches. I mean, it's just story after story after story, and they're all hysterical. It was it was really really fun. But yeah, no, they they definitely got me because I'm back there. You know, I'm trying not to act. You know, he's got things to do. He's a busy man. He's a popular guy. You know, you don't want to be yeah you know, too put off by the whole thing. But I'm a little disappointed at the same <laughs> time. Like you know, I was really looking forward to meeting this guy, and then all of a sudden he came in, and oh, it was it was incredible. So, yeah, it turns out they had staged the whole thing the night before, so it was great. Yeah, uh, they got me pretty good. And your your scorebook never got filled out that game, did it? <laughs> of course not. No, I think about the third inning finally had both sides written in. Yeah. Just like his minor league experience. That's good. Yes. That's right. <laughs> it really is something I'm just, Especially those doubleheaders. The, the 30 minutes oh. between oh, games. Oh, so bad. Especially if you're the home team trying to send out lineups, print. I had Kyle, when he was working with me, running all around the ballpark. I mean... Poor kid. We had moves we couldn't make official until the start. Yes, of the we had a lot game, of roster so, moves like that. Um, yeah, printing so. out pitching changes, mid mid double header. Oh those yeah, those were fun. It's, those it's, were no, there was nothing fun about those. <laughs> just to be clear, there was nothing. There, there are not a lot of fond memories of minor league double headers, except for the fact that I think there were seven innings. So yeah. Perfect transition to my next question, Tommy. Good. Uh, favorite Southern League story. What's what's the the best that we can tell on a show being in the southern yes yes <laughs> so probably 2015 because I'm involved those are the best right but now just like in general yeah. what is the best southern league story that you got let me hear it do you uh, have any when I was at uh, the baseball grounds of Jacksonville throwing the door open for the first time and seeing Kyle Crooks uh, you know sitting what in the video booth with my good so friend. much to you I knew my life was going to be <laughs> that was my Bob Euchre moment. <laughs> <laughs> was it? No, it was not. You've got to set your sights way higher if that's the case. No, I, I think from my Southern League days, I, I had the. There's a couple. Uh, the one that stands out to me, I think, because of you know Roger and I, we, we have different styles, but we both take broadcasting, I think, very seriously. Um, and one that just stands out in my mind so much. There's actually three here that. All involved Jacksonville. We got plenty of time. Let's go. Of we course. Start, I'll start with the first one. And I, it, Roger will tell you exactly who hit it uh, in the moment of the game. He could tell you the pitchers. I couldn't. I just remember it's a 
Extra inning game, if I remember correctly. Jacksonville hits a walk-off home run, and uh, my call was something like, swung on and belted to left, way back there, Suns win. <laughs> it was something <laughs> like, just completely lifeless. The crowds, it was a big crowd, so it was one of those moments yeah. where you let the crowd kind of take over. Um, and I, I always, my philosophy has always kind of been, uh, you almost want your reaction to replicate what the what your fans reaction is going to be so you don't if you're if you're excited i want to get excited when when the team you're working for does well if the other team does something i don't necessarily want to be over the moon about it other guys have different flat roger has a different philosophy on that um, yeah i just like i love the fact that the crowd's going up like this and you can kind of yeah. stay there like it's yeah. just a my favorite thing and all my former players, managers will hate me, future teams I work with. My <laughs> favorite, this. favorite call in broadcasting is being the away team and calling a walk-off home run for the home team. There yeah. is just something awesome about, you know, the away broadcaster. You don't have to lose it like you would if it was your home team. And, you know, not necessarily home guys lose it, but there's just something great about that. Like, it's a perfect marriage, I feel like. Right. But anyway, that's – and it was Jake Marisnik, by the way, and I was going oh, yeah, berserk Marisnik. in the next so, booth. Yeah, and, and so Roger comes over. We compare our calls <laughs> side by side after the game. Roger's basically jumping out of the booth. <laughs> to the while, palm trees! <laughs> while, while the ball's still in flight, I think I started packing up my stuff. <laughs> I mean, it was just too – Completely contrasting styles, and the fact that they were so different is what made it so funny. Uh, but that always that always stuck with me. Um, the other one in Jacksonville is uh, so Roger and I have both experienced this. The first cycle I ever saw was Donald Lutz hitting yeah. for the cycle that happened at the baseball grounds, um, which really stuck with me because it was the first cycle that I had seen. I was really excited about it. Um, not to throw Roger under the bus, but I will because I'm about to throw myself under the bus. But Roger was caught off guard by the cycle and that that happens you know it's it was a blowout game very lopsided and and you know when it's your team that's getting crushed sometimes other teams accomplishments slip through the cracks you know when you when it's your guy that's approaching something you're you're locked in on that when it's the other guy sometimes you miss it like when a guy hits two grand slams in an inning <laughs> i think the second one might have been a three run home run also jake marisnik <laughs> <laughs> down and realized he had your number, Tom. No boy, did he ever! He uh, he hits two grand slams right the same inning, wasn't it, Roger? Same inning against the same pitcher, and yeah. kind of with that, that was in Pensacola. So was- milb.com, the highlight that circulates all over the place is Tommy's call, just like yeah. the call that circulated on the Lutz home run to complete the cycle yeah. that I didn't really react to that much. That was my call that went all over the place yeah. from Jacksonville. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so so Jake Marisnik hits his second grand slam of the inning, and uh, I, I look down and I go, "It's a grand slam. That's his second of the inning." <laughs> <laughs> I'm just completely stunned. I mean, think about it. We just given up a minimum of eight runs in the inning, so yeah. it was not going well. It was just one of those moments, but it it was an embarrassing embarrassing moment for me, and it kind of those things I think wake you up and in, in the end make you better. Uh, and then one that really stands out to me just because I think it's one of the greatest pitched games I've ever seen uh, was when Tyler Malley threw his perfect game. And Roger and I had been together the day before. I think we were playing Jacksonville that the day before. Right. And then the next day we started a series with Mobile uh, over at Hank Aaron Stadium, and Tyler Malley was just on fire. I think he took less than 90 pitches to complete the perfect game. He uh threw it against Mobile. There were 150 people in the stand. So that was one of those moments where it was a little tough to let it breathe because the people that were there, I think, knew it was a no-hitter, but they're not exactly going nuts because it's on the road. It's not a big crowd. So how much do you really let it breathe in that moment? Uh, probably could have done a better job, but uh, overall felt pretty good about the way that one went. And that was that's probably the top of my Southern League memories and and probably one of my favorite calls that I've had, too. At least from my minor league days, yeah. So, Tommy, yeah. So, so what are you what are you doing now here in quarantine? Because you're about you're about to embark on the biggest baseball season in your life, whenever that may be. Whether we even have a season in 2020, you have to wait until 2021. There's got to be this this 
pent up anxiousness for you because this is your your first year as the full time guy. And uh, so, so what are you doing right now to to stay ready? And, and I'm sure you are very anxious to get this thing rolling. Yeah, I think yeah, definitely. I mean, I think we all are. I mean, I think uh, everybody across baseball is anxious to get going and, and, and get to playing. And uh, Jeff and I have talked about that a lot. You know, you're just ready to watch some baseball again. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a big year for me personally. But I think for Reds fans, this is a huge year because of all the moves that the Reds made. I mean, that's I mean, my. The, the personal stuff aside, I was really excited to watch this team. Uh, I thought the, the addition of Mike Moustakis that, that kind of got the ball rolling this offseason was incredible. I go back to last year when we got Sonny Gray, and the Reds added Sonny Gray. And then um, the way Anthony DeSclafani finished the season, the way Trevor Bauer looked in spring training, I mean, he looked like he was back to being the, the Trevor Bauer he was when he was battling for uh, Cy Young. Um, and... Nick Castellanos and, 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 you know, the bat that he brings to the table. Shogo Akiyama was finally starting to settle in. I think Joey Votto was poised for a big year. Eugenio Suarez was just about to get healthy um, and coming off the year that he had. Nick Senzel was getting healthy. There were just a lot of things about this team and this season that I was looking forward to and Reds fans were looking forward to. So, uh for that reason, yeah, ready to get things going again and, and ready to start playing baseball. But it's so easy, I think, during all this to just kind of sit around and, and get lethargic a little bit. And, and uh, so I just try to do the things that I wouldn't ordinarily have the chance to do this time of year. I've, um, I've been able to get outside a lot. I've been able to see the city a lot more than I would normally see. The, the spring in Cincinnati has been beautiful I, I i didn't notice it last year and maybe the colors were more this year than than normal but the trees blooming a lot of flowery colorful trees that have been really cool to just take walks and, and go explore some of the parks that um are full of color right now that you wouldn't ordinarily do because you'd be getting ready for a game and then going to the ballpark so uh walking around and seeing different areas of the city that i haven't had a chance to check out uh, i've been trying to eat out quite a bit and get some carry out from restaurants local restaurants and then i cook a lot i love to cook so it's given me a chance to do some of that and Didn't know that wow Didn't yeah know that we never got the end. I, I got a couple invites to a tommy thrall cookout in pensacola but you did yeah yeah, yeah. they were always but, good yeah so i like to cook so i like to uh, i've been doing a lot of that and uh, i haven't grilled enough i need a new grill is what really needs to happen i need to go buy a new grill that needs to be top of the priority list because now that it's really warming up and it's grilling season i the, the one i have is falling apart i you know probably need, <laughs> take, probably need to get a tetanus shot from all the rust that's on the grill <laughs> after every steak that i eat off that thing at this point but no uh and the other thing that that i i've been trying to do i've really been trying to work out um you know i, I bought a piece of cardio equipment to try to peloton stay in. you could say yeah i got a peloton and uh you know, I we use them a lot on the road. Uh, the hotels that we stay at a lot of times have them, so that's what that was my first taste of them. Loved it. So once my gym shut down, I thought, well, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to be working out, so I got to do something. So I bought one of those. It took about a month to get here, but after I got it, I've I've been on it every day. So it's been it's been good. So try to try to get myself in in decent shape, so that way once we finally get going, maybe I'll look halfway decent. <laughs> oh, that's certainly good. Uh, we'll get you out on this. Uh, once everything does kind of get back to normal, once it is Great American Ballpark, say the Reds versus the Cubs on a Friday night full house, when people tune in to the Reds on the radio, what do you what do you want them to walk away from having listened to a Tommy Thrall broadcast? Oh, boy. Um, I, I want them, I, I want Reds fans to be able to visualize the game, feel like they were there when they can't be there, and have fun listening uh while they're at it i just really want that's those are the two things I, I tell this is the number one thing i think that you can tell a young broadcaster if you sound like you're having fun the people listening will have fun so jeff and i have a great time every time we're on the air together so i want people to to walk away saying you know what that was kind of fun that was a fun listen and you know what i was able to follow the game and that's i think if we can do that on a nightly basis I think we'll do we'll do an all right job, and we'll be pretty happy with the results. And hopefully, they'll listen to a Reds win. 
certainly would be good for the Reds. Well, Tommy, uh, you're not only one of my best friends in the business, but one of my best friends in life. And when I knew this show was starting, you're one of the first people that I wanted to have on it. So we were really honored that you spent this last hour with us and really enjoyed your insights. And I think young broadcasters can learn a lot. So just thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks, guys. I, I enjoyed it. I, I had a blast. And uh, when, when I figured out that this uh, that you guys were going to be on here, it was uh, – it was an easy yes, and I knew we'd have a good time. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Tommy. All right. Big thanks to Tommy Thrall. We'll be back next Friday at noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, another edition of Broadcaster Hour. Thanks for watching, everyone.